Good morning. Welcome to Otter Creek Church, where we are a family growing to become like Jesus. We're so glad you're here this morning. We're also glad we have some special friends in here with us today, because this is an all-together worship. So we really want to welcome our preschoolers. Yeah, our preschoolers and our kindergarten through second graders. We're so glad y'all are in here. Um, thank you for being in here today. If you uh, can grab the attendance registry on the end of the pew and just start that down, because we are a family, we, we just like to know who was here on a Sunday, so we'd appreciate that. Um, and then this morning, as we come together to be encouraged and to encourage, um, I just pray that this morning is wonderful. We also come together to worship, to worship our Lord and our Savior. And I have some special friends here that are going to help us get started with our worship this morning. This is Proclaim, and they are normally the worship leaders for kids' worship and preschool praise. So they're joining us today. And um, they are obviously excited to be in here. But anyway, so when we worship in children's worship and preschool praise, we have a different kind of worship experience sometimes than we do in here. We use our whole bodies to worship. So we're going to be doing that this morning. It's already starting. And if y'all will stand up, we're going to ask you to join in with us. I know it's not your normal way to worship, but if you can encourage us by participating as we praise our Father. And then this next song just spoke to me so much after last week as going through the, the Psalms of Lament and just thinking through that and those deep places that cry out deeply to God. So this is not a lamentful song, but it does talk about those deep places. So sing with us, please.
Let's give them another round of applause. Here we go. Get them together, church.
no other name is greater. So we sing hallelujah to Jesus.
Israel, but the life of a preacher is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves at the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. With these words, God revealed his purpose and his plan for this sacrificial redemption he began for Israel and would eventually fulfill for the world. This redemption is a gracious mercy that flows from a fully just and loving God, and it is the most life-giving force in the cosmos. It is a life that feeds enemies and forgives friends. It is a life that makes blind men see and dead men rise. It is a life that astonishes angels and humiliates hell. It is the life of Jesus poured out that we are now clothed with and covered in. Please pray with me. Father, as we remember the death of Christ and the forgiveness and reconciliation it affords us, let us with grateful hearts embrace life that is truly life as we serve a living God. Amen.
Let's pray for the offering. Father, for your generosity shown to us in the life of your son, Jesus, in the abundant life he has given us in your kingdom to do works of mercy and justice and compassion, works of beauty, works of hope, and works of the resurrection. God, we give thanks for these, our many gifts, and we pray that you find us with a generous heart. It's in Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. A uh, few th pastoral things just to make you aware of as we're receiving the offering. By the way, if you're a guest with us this morning, this is for us who are members of this church. You're welcome, but you're certainly not expected um, to give anything. A couple of things. Number one, a longtime member of Otter Creek, Clive Anderson, passed away last night. If you know the Anderson family and want to um, send them a note or just let them know that you're praying for them this week. The Andersons have a long history with Otter Creek. Um, Susan Lassiter, Lassiter is in the hospital this morning, and um, Phil Gibbs and Lucian Simpson and some others have already been with her this morning. But we ask for your prayers. Phil and Susan have been a, a huge part of this church, uh, especially with the Wayne Reed Center and other important ministry. Um, but Susan's had a hard last four or five days, and she could use a note or a prayer from you. Um, third thing is the Zoe conferences this weekend. If you don't know, Otter Creek helped a long time ago start something called the Zoe Worship Ministry. They go all, they have over the last 20, 25 years gone all over the United States and helped churches um, with worship conversations, renewal, teaching, and they are going to have a conference for worship leaders. You are invited if you want to come and be part of the evening sessions. Those are open to everyone and they're free Friday night and Saturday night. You can find more about that at the zoegroup.org, um, or you can ask me, you can ask Kim Penna, but that is coming up this week. So we'll, um, if you notice extra harmony in second service next Sunday, it's probably because a bunch of Zoe people stayed after um, for, from the conference to be with us. And then probably the most important thing I'll share with you before we get into the teaching is you might remember a few weeks ago, Bethany Haley Williams was up here with me and we were talking about a partner that we have in East Africa through Exile International. One of the most important ministries we support at Otter Creek is Exile. They help children who have seen war, been a part of war, to repair their lives, to, to be mended back together and then to go on and serve their communities. It is truly one of the most gospel things I've ever seen. I would put Exile and Made in the Streets right up there as just undeniable God things that God is doing. We prayed for Joseph. We prayed Jellico prayers, I think, three weeks ago, four weeks ago for Joseph. He's still healing. He does not, as far as I know, have the use of his legs. But because of your generosity and consistency as a church in giving, we were able to write a check as a church to exile to help Joseph, um, who almost lost his life. We wrote him a check for $14,000 because of your generosity. And when we say things like, hey, when we retire the debt, we'll be able to do more for people. This is the kind of stuff we're talking about. So those of you who helped us retire the debt, this is one of the things you get to see and you get to be a part of. We have a little more freedom now and flexibility to respond to things um, that, we, that weren't planned for. So thank you for your generosity. I'm going to teach from Psalm 51, if you want to hold your place in one of the most famous of all the Psalms, Psalm 51. So the first several weeks of this teaching series on worship, we talked a lot about the body and the heart. We talked about raising our hands, uh, jumping and dancing. I got a text from a friend right before I, I shouldn't have checked my phone. It's my fault. But he said, I love you. But man, when those kids were proclaiming and singing, you sure looked like a Church of Christ preacher up there in the front row. Um, we talked about celebrating with God, bringing our whole hearts to God, sometimes when it's appropriate to kneel in humility. We talked a lot about our bodies and our hearts as it relates to what happens on Sunday mornings in worship. And then last week, we shifted our focus to the actual structure and content of the Psalms, our greatest book of worship that we have in the entire scriptures. And we talked about this pattern that you can see in all 150 Psalms, life, death, and resurrection. And I gave you kind of the technical categories that scholars use. It's called orientation, disorientation, reorientation. So when you try and read the Psalms or live in the Psalms, like in your everyday life, they can be confusing. They can seem highly emotional, volatile, almost manic from chapter to chapter. Like, how does this all fit together? And scholars over time have helped us to see there are Psalms of life, orientation, 
when everything is as it should be. Like when you've had that perfect day, I had one of these recently, and you're watching the sunset, and the sun's going down, and you're like, oh, this day has been so good, and who knows what tomorrow's going to be. I don't want this day to end. And then you just slowly watch the sun descend into the horizon. That's the psalm, those are the psalms of orientation. But 70% of the psalms are the next category. Not when life is as, all it, as it should be, but the psalms which say, oh, why is life so hard? Why is there pain at every corner? Why is there deceit? Why do people betray you? Why do people who you think are going to be there for your whole life and support you, then they disappear? As one of my friends says, you know, Josh, everyone leaves eventually. I try to only talk to him once a year. It's very depressing. Um, but those are the psalms of pain, the psalms of hurt, the psalms of, man, I'm trying to live a good life, but even when I try and live a good life, I do things I regret, I hurt people around me, or people hurt me, and then as you get older, your body starts betraying you, and you have all these issues, like, why is life this hard? Is it supposed to be this hard? And the psalmists come along in 70% of, of what we have in, in the Torah, and they say, yes, it's hard, and God's in it. He's in the pit with you. He's in it when you have enemies surrounding you. Those are the psalms of death, psalms of disorientation. And then there's a third category, the psalms of reorientation or resurrection. Now, these psalms don't deny what happens in the seasons of death or in the experience of death, but they say you're not defined by those things. So whatever the worst thing is that you've done or the worst thing is that you've gone through, you don't have to stay there. You don't have to get stuck in a moment. You can continue to move forward. You can continue to believe that there's more out there for you. God has more if you would just trust and if you could just keep going. You don't have to stay in the season. And so here we are, 700 people in this second service, and there are those of you who are in seasons of orientation, seasons of disorientation, and seasons of reorientation, seasons of life, death, and resurrection. And when we sing, we're this chorus of people who come from these three very different places. And to deny any of those seasons of your life is to deny the full experience of what it means to be a child of God. So let me give you some examples of this. A few years ago, I had the privilege of taking my oldest son, Lucas. Now I have to pay him because he's an astute 10-year-old businessman now. So every time I tell a story, I, I owe him money. I took him to watch Kansas, who I grew up loving, uh, my family lived in Wichita for a long time as a child. So I'm a huge Kansas fan. We, they went to play the University of Kentucky at Rupp Arena. Now, if you've never been to Rupp Arena, it's one of the meccas of basketball in North America. It's, the arena is bigger than most professional basketball arenas. And people come from all over the state of Kentucky for these games. It is, without hyperbole, it is a religious experience to watch a Kansas-Kentucky game in Rupp Arena. So for me... As I'm planning this and scored two tickets, I was thinking this is a peak dad life experience. Like this is as good as it gets as a dad, a dad and a son. Like just soak up every moment of this day. So Lucas and I get to Rupp Arena. He's wearing a Kansas jersey. I'm wearing a Kansas sweatshirt. I mean, it's just, it doesn't even matter how the game goes. Truly, it doesn't matter. This is just great orientation. And then, about 30 minutes into walking around Rupp Arena, and there's a mall attached to it, I get the sense that Lucas has seen all these Kentucky jerseys, and he's counting the championships. He's like, wait, Kentucky has like twice the championships as Kansas. I never told him that fact on the drive up. Um, and I start to feel in my spirit, he might use his money to buy a Kentucky jersey. I had not emotionally prepared myself for that. Sure enough, we're in one of the stores. Malik Monk, who's now in the NBA, was one of the best players for Kentucky that year. His jersey's on sale. And before I know it, my son is taking a Kentucky jersey, and he's pulled it over, and he's put it on top of his Kansas jersey, and he's walking around like this. And now I'm the only one of like 3,000 people who has anything Kansas on. He betrayed me right there in front of all of those people. So he keeps the Kentucky jersey on. Kentucky goes up by 11 at halftime, and it's looking like the first five minutes will determine the whole game here. During halftime, I don't know if an angel spoke to Lucas or what happened. That's between him and God after his iniquity of what he did. But he 
leaned over to me and he said, I think Kansas is going to come back and win. And he took the Kentucky jersey off and they came back and won. And we were in the lobby with the 10 other Kansas fans who had scored tickets to that game. I've got one of the best videos of me and Lucas celebrating. And I realized this is the Psalms of life, death, and resurrection. Like I've experienced the whole thing in just one three-hour experience. Uh, now, Finn would never do that to me. But the oldest son would do that to me, right? Okay, that's a silly example. But what I'm saying is when you start to see that pattern woven into your life, you start to see it everywhere. Life and death and resurrection. You see it in relationships. You see it in the arc of your career or job opportunities. You see it in dreams deferred and then dreams renewed. You see it in the seasons of life on planet Earth. You see it in all these different ways because... Usually, if something is profoundly true, it's true everywhere. And it becomes the way that you make sense of your life. So I have a friend, Simon. Some of you know him. Those of you who got to go to Israel uh, on our last trip, Angela, you got to meet Simon. Um, I have a friend, Simon, who helped bring American Idol from England and Australia to the United States with his dad. And people are like, it's never going to work. It became the biggest TV show at that point in United States history. When he tells his story, it is a story of life and death and resurrection. He grew up in an affluent home in London. He had everything he could ever want. He went to the best boarding schools. He was taught by the best teachers. He could go anywhere he wanted to in the world. And then eventually got to a point in his 20s where he had so much, it drowned him. And he became filled with secrets and addictions. And he went through an awful, public, messy divorce and everything just hell just broke through in his life until, in his own words, God started to pursue him through a series of dreams. Now, for a British man who comes from an entirely atheist or agnostic home to feel God was pursuing him in his dreams is the great sense of humor of God. And as God pursued him in his dreams and he started to deal with his alcohol addiction and he started to deal with the other things that he was going through in his life, he felt himself being pulled out of the pit that you read about in the Psalms, the, the Sheol, the dark place, the cave, whatever metaphor you want to use. And then God took him to a new place. And he's had setbacks and then he stepped forward, but he's not the same person. And it is amazing when you see someone walk through those seasons of life and you get a front row seat to it, you know it's the Spirit of God at work because there's nothing else that could do that in a person's life. Life and death, and resurrection. I think about my friend that I grew up with in Detroit, Katie Kirkpatrick. She was homecoming queen, valedictorian of her high school. She was all state basketball. She played basketball at Rochester University. I was older than her. She was diagnosed her freshman year of college with a uh, brain cancer. She had a brain tumor, incurable, within four years of the diagnosis as she was an 18 year old. Within four years, by her 22nd birthday, she passed away. Life and death, and when you're around anyone who's close to her, they are hanging on the hope of resurrection. They're not there yet, but they're right on the doorstep, knocking, praying that none of this is made up, that it's all true, that they will be reunited with her. Her father later then died of a similar brain cancer, and her, mo her mother, his wife, and other siblings are praying life and death and resurrection. See, some people are desperate for those seasons to be true. Some people cannot function in their lives without the knowledge that you don't have to stay where you are. So listen to how David names this in Psalm 51. Dave, the context of Psalm 51, as far as we can tell, is that David has become a public farce the person he pretended to be, the, piece, the person he convinced everyone that he was, was not true. He wasn't nearly the man after God's own heart that he had promoted himself to be. He's ruined lives. He's taken the life of an innocent man named Uriah. Uh, the child that he's had with Bathsheba has passed. Everything is in disarray. His house is turned against him because of his deceit and corruption. 
And he sits down to pen these words. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. That word there is hesed. It's one of the most repeated phrases in the Bible. Your steadfast love in all the seasons, life, death, and resurrection. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Isn't it interesting that David doesn't just say mistakes or indiscretions or unfortunate happenings? He calls what he's done sin. There's only certain words that match the actions. He says, I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I'm thinking Uriah might have something to say about that. And done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. I think what David is saying here is, look, some people get into a difficult place in life because of decisions other people have made or circumstances that you can't control. And that's true. And some of you are in that season. David's talking about something else. David's talking about the truth that most of us get into difficult situations because of the choices we've made. And we spend a lot of time deflecting and trying to blame other people or talk about what other people could do. And if these people just did this and if they would just do what I want them to do. David recognized in this moment, look, I am where I am because of what I've done. Period. I have created the world that I'm now living in. That's what he's trying to say in theological language. You desire, verse 6, truth in in the inward beings. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. He's going to come back to that. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Anytime you see renewal, or resurrect, which is resurrect, um, or rejoice. That is reorientation language. It's resurrection language. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities, because there are a bunch. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. Now we're to the worship part. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give you a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. Some of your translations say humility. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. So what you hear in David is a man who remembers when things were good. He remembers when Goliath fell, right? He remembers when he became a king under the most unusual circumstances and anointing. He remembers when he was at the apex of his leadership. So what you have now is a man who stands in between his past and his future. And his future doesn't look nearly as good as his past because of all these bad choices that he's made. And as he stands on the cusp of being consumed by the darkness of his future, he looks back and he says, God... I know what I've done, and I'm done pretending, and I'm done hiding, and here's all my iniquity, here's all my transgressions, here's all of my sin, and now God, would you take out this secret heart, would you take out this deceptive heart, and would you replace it through the power of your spirit with a pure heart, with a heart that's actually after you in all things. Because I want to sing again. I want to be restored. So he is on the cusp of going from death to resurrection. Of disorientation to reorientation. I think that probably the only network television show that's worth, this is a bold statement, but probably the only network television show worth watching right now 
um, is a, a show called This Is Us. Have any, any of you watched This Is Us? Pretty remarkable show. Um, one of the few shows that Cara and I like to watch together. But I remember walking through a particular difficult challenge uh, with a member of Otter Creek when this show first started. And here's how it works for me. Usually the two hardest things that people deal with in life is either death or divorce. Separation, anything could be kind of categorized within divorce, hard, hardship, or death. And there was a particular friend of ours who was going through a really hard thing about the time this show started. And I was trying to talk to members of the family about, look, you're in a really hard season, but it's just a season. See, this is the thing when you get into a hard season. You cannot imagine that there's anything beyond what you're in. That's the lie. Now, you're stuck in this bad place. You're depressed or you're sad or you're lonely or you're, and you can't see anything beyond that. And you need people in your life to be able to tell you this isn't all there is. Trust me. You, if you continue to endure, you can push through to the other side. That's why suicide is so tragic because most of the time, people who kill themselves believe that ending it is better than continuing in the season that they're in. And ending it seems like a good solution. And so people come along, whether it's through a counselor, a hotline, or a pastor, or a preacher, and they say, no, this isn't the only season that you have to be in. And this is what's happening. The first episode, the first season of This Is Us, is the main character, Jack, and the other main character, his wife, Mandy Moore. I can't remember her real na other name in the show. But they're having triplets. It's 1980. And one of their babies died in delivery. And Jack, who has lived his own painful life, of alcohol addiction because of what he experienced in Vietnam and a terrible relationship with his dad is panicking because he doesn't feel like his life has prepared him to know what to do in this situation. And the director of the ER, an old wise man, sits next to him and says in four minutes what usually takes me four hours of counseling to convince someone of. Listen to their conversation. Rebecca's vitals are good. She's going to be asleep for a little while, but she's doing fine. We're monitoring her closely. Okay. We lost the third baby, Jack. I'm, I'm very sorry. The uh, second baby is a girl, very strong. The third baby was a little boy, but the uh, umbilical cord was cutting off his oxygen. He was still born. Nothing anybody could have done. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not processing anything. My wife is fine. And she'll be awake pretty soon. You have two beautiful, healthy children, Jack. Boy and a girl. But we did lose the third child. I'm going to be with my wife. And you will be. But she needs to sleep now, but soon. You just sit down. Sit. Sit. Okay, if I keep you company a second. Yeah. <sighs> okay, if I try and say something meaningful. I lost my wife last year, cancer. That's the reason I still work so much at my age. Just trying to pass the time. <laughs> we were married 53 years. Five children, 11 grandkids. But we lost our very first child. reason I went into this field, truth be told, I have spent five decades delivering babies, more babies than I can count. 
but there is not a single day that goes by that I don't think of the child I lost. And I'm an old man now. I like to think that because of the child that I lost, because of the path that, that he sent me on, that I have saved countless other babies. I like to think that maybe one day you'll be an old man like me. Talking a younger man's ear off, explaining to him how you took the sourest lemon that life has to offer and turned it into something resembling lemonade. If you can do that, then you will still be taking three babies home from this hospital. Maybe not the way you plan. I don't know if that was meaningful or senile, but I thought it ought to be said. Your wife will still be asleep for a little while. Go see your babies. They're excited to meet their father. I think maybe they got a good one. In 1862, a man named Joseph Gilmore was troubled by what he saw in the United States. This was the onset of the Civil War. And he saw in the future, the near future on the horizon, all the death and carnage and division that was coming to the United States. And he saw it for what he was, a truly tragic cultural moment in the country that he loved. But he loved Jesus more and he loved to write hymns. And so he wrote down these words that became a classic. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. My favorite verse in that entire song is the last one. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace thy victories won, e'en's death could wave, I will not, cold wave, I will not flee. Since through in triumph, since thou in triumph leadeth me. I think about some of the people's stories that you've heard over the last several years. I think about Tommy Caldwell, one of the best free climbers in the world, who stood on this stage and told you his story and how he went from seasons of life to death to resurrection. Or Trent and Trevin Dilfer just a few weeks ago. Or Scott Hamilton, the Olympic gold medalist, in his fight with cancer. Or Father Strobel or Nahed Zir, a Palestinian believer who talked about what it's like to go through all the hard things in life. Or when Pat Ward talked, us what, talked through us, for us, what it's like to deal with domestic violence and divorce. Or my friend Irene Flannery Little who talked about losing her husband um, as they lived in Manhattan, what everyone thought was this perfect life. And when I think about some of these people who have borne witness and their stories have stayed with me, I think, isn't it fascinating that in all the seasons of life, they continued to believe that God was working. See, it's easy to believe that God is alive and working when you're in the season of orientation. It's actually really easy. It's harder to make opposite arguments in those seasons. But the really fascinating thing to me is when I live and and share life with people, like the list I just named, who believe in the power of God in the seasons of life, in the seasons of death, and in the seasons of resurrection. And that's the question that I pose to you this morning. Whichever season you find yourself in, whichever psalm names your life, can you continue to sing the songs of God regardless of your circumstances. That's when you know there's something real about your faith. It's not just God's good to me, so I'll sing God's songs. It's even when I feel like God has abandoned me or God isn't fulfilling his promises to me. It's even in those seasons, and it's in the seasons when you're doing better, but you still have all the memories of the pain. Can you still sing the songs of God in every season of life? Would you stand with me?
He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hand. He leadeth me, his faithful follower I would be for by his hand. He leadeth me, and when my task on earth is done when by thy grace the victory's won in death's cold wave i will not flee since thou in triumph leadest me he By his own hand, he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. God, we pray to you as Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And God, we pray in the midst of seasons of life, as David prayed and wrote and sang. We pray in the seasons of great disorientation and death. And we pray in the seasons of renewal and resurrection. God, we pray, we sing, we live, we work, we eat, we dance, we celebrate in all the seasons because we know you have not changed. And God, even though our circumstances change, and even though our emotions change, and even though our confidence changes, God, we know that you hold it all together. God, the whole thing belongs to you. By your word, you spoke it into existence. And out of your love and generosity, you made everything and called it good. But God, we get stuck in seasons. We get stuck in our emotions. We get stuck in our selfishness and we lose sight of your goodness in all things. So God, we cling to the hope and the faith of David and Katie Kirkpatrick and Simon Lithgow and so many saints who have gone before us. And God, we pray that at the end of our lives, Psalm 13 would be our anthem. And we pray from the crown of our head to the tips of our toes, as Proclaim reminded us earlier, that we can sing this truth regardless of the season. And so we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. your face for me long enough long enough have I carried this load of sorrow long enough long enough have I lived with this heart for
I will sing at the top of my tongue. Yes, I will sing of your unfailing love. Oh, for you have delivered me from the worst of my enemies. So I will sing to the to me. So I will sing at the top of the top. Yes, I will sing of your unfailing love. Oh, for you have delivered me from the worst of my So I will sing at the top of my lungs. Yes, I will sing of your unfailing love. Oh, for you have delivered me from the worst of my enemies. So I will sing to the Lord. with me as we close the service with a blessing from Ephesians. I pray that from God's glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your heart as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. 
may you have the power to understand, if all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Go in peace.
There's a grace when the heart is undivided Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone It was another ring Standing next to me, it was another in the waters holding back the sea. And should I ever meet reminder of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I will bow to the things of this world. Oh, yeah. I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another. Another 